Our guest today is Bill Simmons, and uh, he is a podcast joggernaut. He uh, is the head, <laughs> I like that word. Sure. He's the head of The Ringer on Spotify, and it's a huge, huge network of podcasts. He's a sports guy from Boston. He's been all over ESPN, and we go over that. But the main feature of this particular episode, which I had <laughs> a lot of fun with, is he said after, <laughs> I want to talk about Saturday Night Live. And so David and I have never been asked this many questions by a guest. Um, and so we go over a lot of SNL stuff inside baseball. I, I think we got to stuff that we've not talked about in that in the ways we talked about. So I really enjoyed it with Bill Simmons. Yeah, he's he's a deep diver. He knows everything. And, you know, the funny part was, Dana, we had... A lot of questions about is the NFL fixed and this and that. I had a lot of questions for him about sports, and mm -hmm. I asked one, <laughs> and then he yeah. goes, "I want to talk about SNL with you guys," and but and I'm like, "Well, it wasn't really interviewing us, so he just talked about different favorite things, and we got some backstory on him." Yeah, he he's a very interesting cool. character. He he'll talk about anything, uh, the the financing in in podcasting movies that he's a fanatic about. <laughs> Um, and yeah. gambling, sports gambling, sports. He talks about the Super Bowl and just a lot of SNL. Uh, he is maybe, I'd have to say, is he the biggest fan of just SNL yeah. that we may have ever interviewed? So that's interesting in itself. He knew, he knew more than anyone. And we did a pretty long one. He could have gone on, I think, much longer, <laughs> but mm. we both had to use the bathroom. So we uh, turned out. <laughs> but um, he was great. All right, here he is, Bill Simmons. This is my setup. This is where I do my pod. Nice. So I got all my all my stuff behind me, so it looks like I'm in this big. And then if you zoom out, it's just like this little weird corner of stuff. And then nothing else looks like that in the room. Fake busy corner. Yeah, fake your, busy corner. Yeah, I'm in an uh, abandoned motel uh, near near Bakersfield, and uh, Dana was taken. I put he's, do he's not to Brie Larson in room. <laughs> God damn. I'm a, I'm a minimalist. Good one. <laughs> Everyone yeah. like, knock and give me food. I'm a minimalist. What, do, what can I say? God, no shit. So should we? So, wait, I have to ask Bill first. There's no way. What did you have to do with 30 for 30? I just saw this. I created it. I came up with the that's idea. No, that's I sent huge, the memo. dude. And then uh, for like a year and a half, me and my friend Connor show, like basically came up with every angle of it and got it sold. That's in my notes. Yeah. yeah. I don't want to talk about me, though. I want to talk SNL. No. Let's, let's see. We don't need okay, to talk about me. Okay, I know. Okay. No, you're boring. I understand. I understand. Yeah, yeah everybody um, knows you. Okay, top <laughs> uh, best athlete. I'm trying to do a mashup of Bill Simmons. <laughs> best athlete host on SNL. Oh, wow. That's a tough one. Does The Rock count? What's a rock on? Um, he's an athlete. Well, he's a movie star, but yeah, no, he's an athlete. The Rock was really good. I mean, he did the the Rock Obama, which I thought was the one rock of the better Obama, presidential sketches funny. they did in the oh, last yes. twenty years. Yes, that was funny. The Rock is good. Yeah, there's Peyton Manning back Peyton in Manning my, was good. my day. Joe Montana with Walter Peyton. Yeah, but was, I mean, Montana was in one of the iconic sketches of the late eighties. That the I'm going to go upstairs and masturbate, which was right, like that, out of, nobody could believe he did that back in the day. I was like, yes. oh my God, Joe Montana said masturbate. And you know what? Fun fact, talk about how, fun fact, talk about how competitive Joe Montana is. He finishes the show and he landed that sketch, which killed. Yeah. And then he, he, he can't come out of his dressing room, almost like a boxer. He feels... He feels he didn't do very well, and Joe, wow. can, can you go talk to him? He just he just can't come out. You know, it's just funny. <laughs> Jesus, jo John Madden was good too. It was before your time, but he uh, he came in right as he was taken off from CBS, and they built it was during the Eddie era. Yeah, they built the whole show around him, and he was pretty he was pretty good with that. I I want to say OJ hosted in the first five years, and thank God he didn't kill anybody. Oh, he killed. So yeah, he I literally say, killed. I had to say it. I know it's not funny, but I had to say it. Charles Barkley during David's era. He was good. I just missed him. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, sometimes he was good. it's tough. Hey, did Joe Montana have any problem with that joke, Dana? No, I don't think so. I'll be up, his inner monologue was, yeah, I'll be upstairs masturbating. Yeah. Yeah. There was a charm when athletes come on or non professional actors, there's a sort of, 
kind of stilted charm to them, <laughs> you know? Right. I find that that's a big, big part of the show is having movie stars, non-comedians, try to do an hour and a half of a live sketch. It's a ridiculous task. So it's, it's a great reality show. I think when MJ came on, that was about as, f in the running for about as famous as he ever was. That was really when he had ascended to the A++ list. And yeah. um, everybody was so interested to see how he would do. And he did really well. Yeah, but it, it just felt like a moment when he was on. That cha changed 8H. Uh, everybody was flipped out. So yeah. he was Michael Jordan at that time. And uh, he was... Um, it's a real interesting part of being a cast member, being behind the slats with Michael Jordan, and we're about to go and do the sketch, and it's live, and he's not in his element. He's kind of looking at his script, and I said, you know, just look at the card. Don't worry about it. Christopher Walken does it. Just look at the card if you have to. Like, well, and they're the so idea. used to coming through in pressure that yeah. eventually yeah. you come out, and the adrenaline is running, and it's basically no different than if they have a big game or something like that. I was... When I, you know, when I got to know Seth Meyers and Hader and those guys in the late 2000s, they popped on my mm -hmm. pod. I was always so interested in the mechanics of the person coming on who hosted, who fit in right away, what actor, actress, comedian, who just kind of got the show and could have been like a surrogate cast member versus somebody who came in and was just kind of their head spinning the whole week. And then certain mm -hmm. people would come in and you guys that were on the show would be like, oh, this isn't easy. This person gets it. This guy, this guy or this girl could actually be on the show full time. Well, I don't, I'd be curious what those guys said off the top of my head. Like John Goodman was like a cat. He was just good at everything. Tom Hanks, of course. Tom Hanks was a great one. Yeah. Completely committed. By the way, I want to just for a second, check your memory. What was the hit sketch kind of objectively for Michael Jordan's episode? Wasn't it the Stuart Smalley? Yes. Yeah. yeah. And then there was a, uh, there was a naked thing. I mean, I'm I'm top, top, top percentile SNL fan that has ever been on this show, including all the people who have been on it. You're just not going <laughs> to. I grew up with the show. I was an only child. I remember every single season, everything that happened. I'm just, I'm going to have an answer okay. for every question you have. I now, I now put you, I knew you were a fan and a sports fan, but now I put you in context. So now you're one of those people, which is great. There's not that many of them that are comprehensively dug into that show so let's should we try to see if we can stump well, it <laughs> here's the thing we i told spade this when we did a podcast like i'm i was born in 1969 that's literally the perfect year to grow up with the show because mm -hmm. i was six when the when the show premiered i wasn't mm -hmm. able to watch it till i was maybe eight or nine they started running the half hour kind of highlight shows on nbc that would be like mm -hmm. nine o'clock nine thirty, whenever that was on and that's how belushi was my first guy i'm like who is this i'm like eight I'm like, this is, this, oh, how, sure. how does this person exist? Started watching those. They finally let me stay up late for the fifth season, my parents. And then I was all the way through. Eddie, uh, when you came on, when uh, mm -hmm. when Spade, like the height of the 90s and all that, then Hartman, I mean, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Farrell coming back and basically Farrell, saving yeah. the show and it felt like it was in trouble. Uh, yeah. I've been there for every piece of it. Wow. Have you, have you, did you ever entertain going into the business of what we're in? So ironically, bit. I did. I was, I was, um, in the mid nineties, I was writing for, uh, the Boston Herald and trying, I really wanted a sports column in the high school newspapers. And it's like, I have no chance. This is never happening. Mm -hmm. And I lived with a guy who I'd done a lot of comedy stuff with just for fun. And we knew this guy named Bill Lawrence, who, um, I think he's a producer. He, yeah. He's a, he was yeah. mm -hmm. at the time he was on the show friends and he had yeah. an SNL connection. And it was the year when everything blew up, when the New York Magazine, when they wrote that piece, and it was uh, that when they were coming in and they're blowing up the show, summer of 95, maybe. Yeah. And we did this whole packet and we sent in, you know, 20 pages of stuff. Now I learned later, like, there's no way anybody even saw it, but we sent it in. And we're like, this is it. This is our big break. Uh, and it never happened. But without, uh, oh, you mean without a, uh, an agent or something, just sending in a packet? No, but we had like, oh, a guy knows a guy. It was one of those, but you don't know uh -huh. any better. I was living in Boston. But we're not supposed like, to, you know, we're not supposed to read them. When we were on the show. We were talking yesterday about how we had mailboxes, you know, there wasn't email. So right. Dana's was always full and then, uh, and Mike <laughs> Myers and then everyone else has started getting full. But, but if people sent packets, which a lot of people would send us scripts and stuff. And to this day, if you read, they can sue you. So you really can't even- right. Read it in case you don't like it, but three years later, there's a sketch like that on the show. 
It's very easy to think yeah, see, of something. We didn't know that in Boston. We're yeah, just like, this I know, is it. They're going to hire problem. us. We'll be able to come in. We'll be hanging with Sandler. And it just it did not happen. Better keep my summer free so I can go in there and prep when they call right away. <laughs> what was your first sketch that that was the top of that 20-page pile? What was it? What was the topic of it? It was a big Friends parody. It was I the read, first I year read, of Friends. Yeah. And we did a long... You, you, you probably saw it in the pile. No, it was I a saw big it in the pile. <laughs> <laughs> and I told Lauren, it's not happening. <laughs> It's all right. He'll 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 do he'll do fine. I remember um, we had another one about Jesus making Jesus coming back and like signing with Nike and doing this whole. And we were like, really, this is so edgy. This is going to be great. Now I like I read it. Now I'd want to kill myself. <laughs> well, yeah, it's, but it's sometimes a, stuff was funny anyway back then. When I even look back at sketches that are like clanking, it seemed to work yeah. then. And uh, you just don't know. And then later you embarrass. But some of them actually still hold up. Yeah, we're going to. Well, it's yeah. funny with your era, the sketches were mean in a good way. Like some of the stuff, <laughs> I like some of the Carson stuff Dana did. Yeah. You go back and you watch it. You're like, ooh, man. Like, was Carson okay with this? I just don't know if oh. stuff's not mean in the same way, especially SNL, which is way more celebrity friendly than I think it was. But back then it was like, yeah. like Rob Lowe did that, uh, the, the Arsenio Beckman, whatever that one was like the Arsenio parrot. It's like, man, this is kind of mean, Yeah, but it was good. That's what we all grew up with. That was what made us laugh. I don't know if there's a better way to put it, but if there's an elephant in the room or what you're not supposed to say or what you're observing, you just need to tease that out. That's why it's funny, you know, yeah. and then it can be construed as mean or not mean, but Johnny was fine with it. He actually liked Carcinio. You know, he said, oh, really? They're making fun of um, Arsenio as much as they're making fun of us. That was, and then there was one sketch that got him dinged, and I was blacklisted casually from the show. Um, so bittersweet memories, but of course I revered Carson, and I revered doing him. I've never had more relaxed fun than being in the Johnny, the Ernest Nebraska guy. That that's well, just a great. You know, Bill's here, and uh, you uh, apparently have a very big podcast called, it's called The Ringer, I understand. You know, that interviewer right. with that voice hasn't been replaced yet, but we've had some great people, but not, not no Carson yet. Well, then you did the Larry Sanders episode, which yes. in the bet, the, one of the best seasons in the history of television, season four, but uh, where you come on and you're doing the impression and they're trying to keep Larry from finding out that Dana has his impression of him, that he sees it. And yes. then it's a whole cat and mouse game of whether he's going to do it on the show. But you actually <laughs> have the mustache on and the fake teeth. You're like, hey, I had the ass teeth. My ass. Oh, and it, was... it, yeah. And I heard Gary was tweet by it later, but I, I told him, I said, I'm just doing <laughs> one frequency that you use in your stand up. Something. And I don't even know what he's trying to do to me. <laughs> you know, it's like Jay Leno. Yeah, it goes like that, but he doesn't talk like that. You know, but anyway, yeah, he goes were, like this too. I do think that was different <laughs> way back in the day where you would take a piece of something and both of you guys did it. You'd take a piece of whatever and then you blow it out and now it'd become the impersonation, right? Like Will Farrell did that with, with when he was doing W. He, he yeah. took like small pieces of it. It wasn't even close to being W. You did that when you did uh, George Bush Sr., same thing. Oh, yeah. Now I feel like when they're doing the impressions, it's more like a dead on impersonation of somebody is the trend now. But back then it was yeah. like, I'm going to take this one piece and go crazy with it. I, I'm doing it with Biden currently because I, you know, you need to, you know, I said this yesterday, but my latest toy is so abstract. It's the only one who understand Biden is, is Hunter. So then I, then I can do Biden of anything. Hey, dad, what's going on? Yeah, right. it's just goes, goes to people, says hi. Oh no! I already ate. Maybe tomorrow night. Yeah, because I so so sure. Yeah, seven thirty is great. Okay, you know. So I I find for myself in high school with my friends. I don't want to ask you this. Abstracting my impression of the water polo coach into madness, and then that rhythm extenuated, but coming mm -hmm. from someplace real, like Will's W was in a real zone, but so playful. Yeah. I just like the style of it. I also like people who could do a perfect impression too, but I do like abstracting it. I mean, that was Hartman. Like when, when I was in college and we would tape it, you know, we'd have like the <laughs> v VCR player. So we'd tape it. We yeah. watched it the next mm -hmm. day. It was like a Sunday ritual. And Hartman did the McMahon. And we thought the McMahon was like the funniest thing of all time. It wasn't really, you know, there were pieces of Ed, but his version of McMahon, we yeah. thought combined with the Carson, we just like, 
we would be imitating, we'd be talking about it. But Hartman was really good at, he did that with the Sinatra group too. Um, oh yeah. Oh sure. Whereas same thing, like his version of Sinatra, Piscopo was like more of an impression mm-hmm. and he would have fun with it. I know Piscopo was on your pot. I loved it. Um, but great, great Sinatra, Sinatra. Yeah. The Hartman Sinatra was a little bit like, uh, I don't know, a little rowdier, a little angrier. And I thought it was funnier. What about Ed McMahon doing it when it, all he has to say is yes, and you are correct. Just those yeah. little hooks, just saying it over and over. You are correct, sir. And then when he goes young, uh, older reference lost on younger viewers. <laughs> yeah. Yes, because the, <laughs> uh, that yes. was where <laughs> Phil was the laugh bomb, and I didn't have to carry that weight. I was kind of doing yeah. this rhythm and setting it up, and very sincere. And I know that you are correct, sir. Yeah, old reference lost on so. <laughs> It was yeah. just a like a, a magic show. It was like do 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 do, and then boom. But yeah, it, Phil but was just. There was maybe- a piece to that Carson thing though, where you were tapping into something that I think people my generation were feeling. Where like Letterman was our guy for my generation. Yeah. Like the the most yeah, important yeah. things that happened to me when I was like twelve, thirteen was Eddie Murphy and Letterman, and just kind of going on the ride with both of those guys from eighty two yes. to eighty five. And Carson, I loved Carson. Everyone, you know, for for three generations, Carson was with three channels. Everyone watched right. Carson, but he did start to seem a little old by the time we got to the late eighties. And when you guys yeah. kind of crossed the beams and went after him a little bit in a fun way, but you still went after him. It was a little like when Norm went after Letterman in the mid nineties. It was the same thing where he loved Letterman. But right. the fact that he was parroting him was like, oh, okay, we're doing this now. Well, I would say built to that that I kind of realize that everybody, every comedian becomes a caricature of themselves. Like, am I looking at this comedian and and maybe actor or whatever, or am I looking at an impersonator? So there's just this redundancy to your character. But with Johnny, Jay Leno told me, uh, he was guest hosting back then, Johnny was still around, that Johnny would walk down at NBC in Burbank and just yell out, they're making fun of me now, it's time to go. So right. that was Johnny, who's obviously was very bright, kind of reading the tea leaves, you know. And, and then you probably, never went on again, right? I didn't. Well, so what happened when you did Dennis Miller, who you were friends with, who used to be on the very show, good and then you did Dennis. Dennis Miller cooking? But did he like that? Did he think it was funny? Well, Robert Smigel writes these pieces that are brilliant, and they're they're a little cutting. I with that because I was good friends with uh, with Dennis. I just called him, you know and said, we're doing the cooking show, the thing. And he goes, okay, that's all right, you know? I mean, it's hard to say no, even though you don't like it. I don't think anyone really likes an impression when they're, it's like getting a caricature, uh, you know, on It's on all the, the things you're fearful or, of yourself. Yeah, all the things you don't like. Right. They did me about three weeks after I left SNL. I'm like, let me get out of the building. Jesus, let, let the body get cold. <laughs> Fucking I, like, Well, you had Terry idiot. Hatcher sitting next to you for the Spade in America that time. Oh, that was. And I, I thought well, I that was that, one though. of the best ones you ever did. And she just started doing you, and it was like, oh shit, what's going on here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But at least I got to be there and give her jokes and things to say to so make yeah. it funny and make her at least get get more of the laughs because she was the host. But she was great about it. Yeah, that was that was actually a fun one because I was there. But like when you did Dennis with Tom Hanks, that was fun. But Dennis is in on it. And then I think he doesn't mind. And he, and he sort of is that way. And his voice is so perfect to do. Uh, I think he was always cool about it. And he's, he's so, and he's so great. It, it, and it's so, when you have a, a, a way of speaking that can be, it's just very unique. And I think that's all ultimately. I, it was just from hanging out with Dennis a lot and yeah, touring yeah. with Dennis and just extrapolating that attitude. But, you know, I was standing outside a hotel, Dennis, and I were playing Dallas or something. And I said, ah, it just hit me that your whole comic motif is like, <laughs> life is really fucked and it's really hard. Like, so, because the car at the airport, they get the car gets you to the gig, right? But mm. when you do the gig the next morning, the car's always late, which I pointed that out to Dennis. And then he just, <laughs> he laughs so hard, me going dark, you know? They got us in, but now fuck it. Now it's a half hour late, flight's leaving, you know? And he died with that. But I, I just think that attitude is still so funny to me. Bill, Billy Simmons, huh? <laughs> SNL cat. Huh? I got the photographic memory like a junior Kreskin here. So funny. Yeah. Kreskin's always in there. You know, we golf <laughs> once in Palm Springs and he goes, uh, we drive all the way there. And he goes, uh, he goes, you want to go golf in Palm Springs? I was like a newer comic. 
And he goes, uh, I go, yeah, yeah. So he goes, yeah, okay, I'll meet you out there. I'm like, oh, we don't want to drive together? Like, okay. So we drive all the way Two out there. drive? Yeah. And then we get out there and then uh, we're golfing. And I go, hey, how far to the green? He goes, hey, Spud, you don't have to worry about the green for another fucking nine shots, all right? Hit it as hard as you can. And I'm like, okay. And then, because we were, I don't know. And then he hits two bad shots in a row and he goes, fuck it, I'm heading back. I go, back home to LA. He goes, yeah, fuck that. I go, Dennis, don't be, this is, you're too hard to deal with. Come on, like we're having fun, everything's cool. But I looked up to him so much, I couldn't really talk back to him or bust his balls too much. It took so long to get to that point. But he's still always above me, better joke, right? It's always that thing growing up. Well, who do you look at? That's why when people come on the show, yeah. I still have reverence to certain people because I got there with Dana, with all these guys, because they were always the ones that I looked up to going on. Uh, and then if you ever get in a movie where kids come to you and say, hey, we watch bench warmers or we watch whatever. And then you go, if this is anything close to what it was like when I would watch movies and I saw someone from that movie, I would have fucking freaked out. Because that's all that mattered in my life was those movies. Yeah, we also had less choices back then. I really wonder, like, if you're like 18 now, there's so much mm. comedy and stuff to watch. And yeah. TikTok, all these different places. Yeah, right, I, all I always thought, blended. Like when, uh, I think you guys were both on the, on the show for this, the Partridge Family versus Brady Bunch sketch. Yeah. Like to me, <laughs> that was one of the peak SNL sketches. Not because it was like one of the funniest, but it was like, it hit this time. Everyone watching that show had the same pop culture experiences, right? So anyone mm -hmm. I knew knew the Partridge family. We knew the Brady mm -hmm. Bunch. We knew every Love episode them. of those. We knew Charlie's mm -hmm. Angels. We knew all the early SNLs. We knew the early light. Like we all had like the same 25 things with the same movies. Mm -hmm. So when you guys did that and it was like, oh, they're going for this. Oh, there's more cast members. Oh, they're going to have the mm -hmm. boys crack. And I don't know how you would do that now in 2024, because I don't know if 15, 20 years ago, people like at age 22, like one 19 would have all the same experiences. All that stuff. Yeah, I yeah, don't yeah, know yeah. if it exists. I mean, the biggest show currently kind of is The Bear, which is a great show. But, you know, how far can it reach compared to primetime? I got canceled from a sitcom and we were doing... Mickey Rooney show 24 share or whether it was 30 million or it's just with three channels it was insane but we actually to that sketch we had Melanie Hutzel on who was in it and sh she wrote it and we broke that sketch down for like a half hour on the podcast with her just the part yeah family and the how it came together the Brady Bunch well plus Susan and Day was in it which pushed it over the top but it, yes. I heard even Piscopo when he was on a couple weeks ago on your show and he was talking about how they didn't feel like the show was doing that well, but yet 8 million people were watching or whatever it was. That's what it was like. Like we had right. 11 channels. So even if SNL was kind of failing, everyone was still watching it. And then when SNL started to come back with Eddie, it was like, this is great. SNL's back. And then they had the Billy Crystal season. Did um, you have a crush on day. Susan Day or not? I did. Oh my God. Come on. I mean, growing okay. up with the Partridge family, I was like, Dana liked David Cassidy, but I, me and you liked... Susan Day. <laughs> and well, then, then she was, had the LA Law comeback, which was like, all right. I'm I was into this. it. Okay. Chrissy didn't talk much. Who's more on attractive? The who's more attractive from that Go ahead. era? Elizabeth Elizabeth Montgomery or Susan Day? Uh, Susan Day. I felt like Elizabeth Montgomery was in a, a slightly older, older than, generation, yeah. right? <laughs> they still loved it. Thanks I for loved answering her, that, Bill. <laughs> no, no, I there saw, was like there's three uh, generations. There was like the Peggy yeah. Lipton, Belinda Montgomery generation. There was the <laughs> Lindsay yeah. Wagner, Linda Carter, Cheryl Ladd, Jacqueline loved, Smith generation. Loved. With Susan I was Day. such an easy then, sell. God damn. Oh, yeah. I, I was know, into everybody. All, all the above. All the above. Blythe Danner. The Charlie's or... Angels. Yeah. Blythe Danner. Then we oh. moved to the Dukes of Hazard, Fall <laughs> Guy, Heather Thomas, Catherine Bach, that era. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> you were sold, watching sold, a lot of TV. I was an only child. I was watching sports and TV. What else was I? I had oh, reading me, books. What else was too. I going to do? Me too. I know. I, oh, I know all those shows. I don't know what we've lost. I was, we were going to ask you just because you're have your pulse on, you know, media, podcasting and stuff. It's yeah. like, is John Stewart's coming out in SNL? And what is the influence now of political satire versus 80s and 90s oh, in terms of moving the needle? Uh, I like that phrase. So anyway, talk to that if you want to. <laughs> well, it's I mean, SNL had a huge part with this. I, I would mm -hmm. say maybe the biggest. And 
once Trump came in in 2016, I think it just became a lot harder because when, when the real life stuff is a parody, how do you parody a parody? When you mm. look back to Ackroyd, I mean, you've talked about this on the podcast. Ackroyd's doing Nixon. He's got a mustache. Like everything was way more loosey goosey. <laughs> uh, Ackroyd's yeah. doing Jimmy Carter, t- talking about the Allman Brothers, smoking a doobie with them. And yeah. uh, Hartman does Reagan. I mean, his the Reagan sketch where Reagan's pretending he's out of it and then everybody Mastermind. leaves the room. And I mean, that, yeah. that's one of the great sketches they've ever mm-hmm. done. Yeah. And then once they figured out the debates, the 88 debate, I think, was huge with the Dukakis and yeah. uh, Bush. And there was just so in Lovitz doing the I can't believe I'm losing this guy. I think from 88 all the way through Sarah Palin, SNL really was kind of shaping how people thought in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. I, to me, yeah. like the Sarah Palin thing still makes me mad because. When they had her on with Tina, I felt like that's when something shifted and the celebrity cameo became as important for the show as making fun of these people. And that's that to me is like yeah, the line right. in the sand when the show started to change a little bit. Dana, they'd, have, they'd bring on, they'd have 32 cast members, then they'd bring on stars to play people and not use the cast. I, see. I would be yeah. furious. We had a lot, of, a lot of cameos. Mm. Yeah, I I feel like it's very, it's so different and difficult to be a cast member on that show right now. If you're just coming into established players and I think it's great. I kind of wish I'd stayed a few years longer, but people are staying 10, 12 years and then new people in there. It's such a different dynamic that Lorne is managing the best he can. You know, I thought you stayed the perfect amount of time. Well, I definitely, because Wayne's World hit and my political impressions hit, I got sort of uh, freakily really big, really fast, <laughs> maybe yeah. too big, you know? And so I had so much, so much stuff coming at me, I was almost confused uh, as to what to do. But later on, I realized that I, my own attention, <laughs> attention deficit disorder and sketch comedy, I was like a fish in water in that. That's why I went back to it in ninety. 90- Seven with with uh, the Dana Carvey Smile. show. Love yeah. about right. me. <laughs> yeah. Loaded. What um, about? I'm asking about podcast superstars. What's next for Megan and Harry? Because <laughs> I don't. You, didn't you say something about you've called? No, I love. Use a great I might word. Have said something in the past. Uh, yeah, no, it's a great word. But do they? Is it Hallmark movies now? What's next? What would be the best move? I mean, there's probably a rom com. There's a huge acting comeback for her at some point, right? She should do that Suits show. It's huge now on Netflix. She should just jump right back in. Or some TV, like a Christmas movie where her divorced yeah. husband and they have to be with the kids, but they're stuck in the snow and then they fall back in mm-hmm. love. Yeah, she just needs one of those. Yeah. And she's back. And John Corbett could play her husband. <laughs> no, he's just <laughs> right. a friend of mine. But <laughs> Because all she needs is one thing like that to get big ratings just out of curiosity factor and she's back in Hollywood. I don't know why. I don't know why it she's felt not like jumping back. That was back the biggest reason Suits took off again, though. I mean, of course, she was in it. Huge it's on it's Netflix. Not a secret. Yeah. Do, do you think if Harry came out? I mean, he, he did some event in Vegas where he made fun of himself a little bit or told some jokes. I think that's the move for him. And sure. It could be on this podcast or or on other on yours. But or host I, SNL. Any kind of little, just in the lane of it being funny, he's, he's aware of how people perceive him and stuff, I think it'd be, because they're just monolithic now. We don't really know what they're thinking. They release statements. Mm. and Here, so. Here's one thing I've learned, Dana, I've seen, and I've had my podcast since 2007. Not everybody should have a podcast. <laughs> like, it's okay. It's not like, it's not like a driver's license. You know, some people just can't do it. It's turning people, into it. It's sort of mandatory. Yeah, I just want to make a note because it seems it just like good advice. For the people listening, you don't all have to have one. It's okay. Yeah. It's, it's not it's like having sounds, an Instagram It sounds account. easy and it's kind of hard. It's um, hard. And you have, to, you have to have some level of expertise on something. You have to have some real really. authenticity. I mean, one of the reasons, like think about all the reasons your, your show works. You have a relationship with each other. I'd want to listen yeah. to you guys talk anyway. You have this wealth of SNL related guests, but then also other comedians that could come on that feel comfortable with you. They tell stories. I hear things maybe I didn't know. And Mm. I just feel like I'm hanging out with you guys. Like podcasting's not that hard, but people always over and over again, make it hard. And they come up with, they try to do the idea versus to look at what actually works, which is like, do I want to spend time with the hosts or not? 
over and over again. It's do I want to spend time right. with these people or not, or this person, and that's what works. Where do you where do you interject? Because my uh, you know people tell me about outrage. Outrage. If it's outrageous, it's contagious. You know, a lot of podcasts kind of harbor in you know the idea of clicks and trending. You have the yeah. hot take that gets there first, mm -hmm. and there's that lane. We're sort of we want to make people feel good and be interesting, but we don't, should David and I have a feud, we can cut this part out, but should we find a way <laughs> to get really mad at each other? But no. you know, that, that lane, I mean, it, no, it's you guys just, are good. You guys are doing great. Spade, um, Spade every, like maybe every month could just take a flying pot shot at somebody to see if it could maybe get in a couple places. <laughs> see if I still just got it. Out of nowhere, jumping off the top rope, flying elbow on somebody. Yeah, I, don't know. I, mess around I want that. to, believe me, I want to a lot well, of times. Instead but. of flying the wall, fly on the minute and you bring back <laughs> Hollywood minute, but it's yeah. part of our show. Just Wait, FYI. can we talk about Hollywood minute for a second? Yeah, sure. One of the iconic update of reoccurring things that David did. Did Hollywood <laughs> yeah. minute create Twitter? Ooh. Ooh. Yeah. How about Ooh. that? Yeah. I think it you should take credit for it. Was a, it was a pre precursor for sure. It's basically Twitter. You watch it and it's just like he's throwing out these one liners it's like with a picture. One liners it's like, about a photo. Yeah. Yeah. I think yeah. You should talk to Elon, maybe see if you can get a cut. God damn. I don't know. I, I sometimes hear old Hollywood Minute jokes and I go, God damn. Like some of them are pretty rough. Uh, but I think for Back in the day when it was just uh, fawning over celebrities, that was the only hook it had. It was like, if someone doesn't really know anyone or you don't know me, and I've got sort of an innocent look, and then really, hopefully cleverly. And that's another thing is a lot of the writers, I was going to say, are trying to use me to get through me, even through sketches, through Dana. They yeah. want to get stuff out there, even if it's like anger, and they go, you should do this because they don't have a way to do it. They go, I can funnel it through one of these clowns. And get it out there, and then I'll be on the side going, "Yeah, fuck that guy." And well, so yeah. I, social I had media to has changed that, that a little bit. You're doing tamp. that on the show, and it's just on, right? And right. people taped mm -hmm. it. Then it comes and yeah. goes. And if somebody got mad, maybe you'd read about it in a newspaper or the trades. But mm -hmm. ultimately, you couldn't even newspaper. see it unless you watched it. Yeah. And I think now that the last 15 years, one of the things that's changed with the show is if something, you know, like you have some comment in Hollywood Minute, be like, "Oh my god," and then it turns into a thing. Then the celebrity gets mad. They fire back at you. Now people are reporting about that, and it turns into yeah, a four-day story. It would be before I went to bed that night. It, I would know what hit, what didn't, what was a problem, and then I'd have to have an answer the next day, and then there'd be a feud, and then it would go back, and everyone would have a fucking comment about it. I think that keeps SNL really helps it because if I don't see a sketch, now I follow them, so if I don't see a sketch, I can watch it Sunday morning. They're just like, sketch, 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 like broken out, monologue, this, that, and that's kind of a smart way to sift through to see what's going on there lately. Yeah, totally. Well, it's also interesting to see how the cast members are using, like Chloe Feynman has a really good Instagram account and she's yeah. just like test drives different characters and stuff. And you're watching, yeah. half the time you're watching it going, how is this not on the show? Why am I watching this on Instagram? But it's it a does great seem little like, audition, yeah. It seems she like there's feedback. more creative outlets than probably you had in the mid nineties where you're writing for yourself. If yeah, they the say mirror. no to the sketch, you're basically like, oh shit, all I did was walk out and say goodbye to everybody at the end of that. I did nothing. And then that's it till the next week, right? Yeah, that one stung. That was a little too close to home, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, they come Dana's, me. Like, Dana's like, I don't know how that felt. Ba backstage, uh, Neilan and I, when we were doing Hans and Franz, we would just giggle for hours, uh, you know, going back and forth and stuff. And then it's distilled, distilled, distilled to four minutes. But with podcasting, you can do it long form, you know. I mean, we do have a second podcast where eventually we'll get around to platforming yeah. ideas. We have a video for, one. Oh, everyone's you guys. fucking shitting their pants. Yeah, Jesus, just, just doing. It, it's characters. called too good to be true. <laughs> no, it's, not. it's called Superfly. Well, I yeah, follow. There's an Instagram account that does. Um, I'm listening to Superfly, by the way. You've Thank done like you. three, four episodes. I like it because you're just bouncing around. Which is, Two, ooh, yeah. yeah. You're just doing your thing. We're, we're still getting into it, getting used to it. Kind of no, harder you, you than we thought. Yeah. Well, you guys are buddies, though. You're fine. Um, mm -hmm. There's this Instagram account that runs all these old sketches, and they ran Comedy Killers from Neilan's the. It's a game show. Neilan's the host, and I, I, I don't know if Dana was still on the show, but David probably was, but. Mm -hmm. it's all these categories of things, whether they're a comedy oh, or not. Right. It's I like the categories that. like the Holocaust, child abuse, AIDS, 
<laughs> it's just, and then it goes through and I was Jeez. like, man, what would happen if they ran this now? What would the reaction be? Cause back then we were like, yeah. Oh yeah, this is great. What a great idea. This is so funny. We were all in on the joke. Now people would just get mad. I feel like. I think that's why people like Bill Burr or Shane mm -hmm. or those guys do well, because it's just even Theo, they just say whatever they want. And it's almost like back in time. And then some people go, I don't want to get mad. I just want to laugh or not laugh and not have a big opinion about it and move on. But, and then people yeah, you're get mad right. at them and want to get rid of them. And you go, no, maybe you can't get rid of people anymore. Hopefully just to, if it just falls under comedy, of course, we always think you should be able to do whatever you want, but not everyone But isn't agrees. the reason you guys got into comedy is like part of what was funny is, oh, I probably shouldn't say that or, oh, I shouldn't laugh at that, but that's what was mm -hmm. funny about it. And now sure. the fear, there's there feels like there's more fear than we've ever had with comedy. But I, I agree with you that it's coming back because my son's 16 and he mm -hmm. loves Shane Gillis. And yeah. he like- that generation, I think, is ready to see somebody kind of dance close to the line again. Right. They they went from the super pampered, super mm -hmm. everyone's scared to do anything. And the new people are like, hey, fuck it. Let's get back to just laughing and doing jokes and not because it's all it's all down to like five jokes you're allowed to use. And then everyone's like, okay, I'll accept that one. That one didn't offend anyone. It has no no <laughs> right. corners on it. It's just the most generic, bland dog shit. And some of these comedy specials. They're just sitting, talking, like there's not even earlier. They're just like walking around. You go, is there a joke? Someone's like, oh, I won't have an audience in mind or I won't have this. And there's not, it's not just even jokes anymore or making you laugh. It's like introspective. And I go, I, I personally would go, let's just get back to getting laughs. Mm -hmm. I agree. What do you think, Dana? You know, I, I, you were maybe too young for this when it came out, but Blazing Saddles. So Blazing Saddles is like, uh, it's a peak movie for me. I'm like a senior in high school or something. Yeah, sure. And so I knew <laughs> that Richard Pryor, who co-wrote it with Mel Brooks, was not racist <laughs> and neither was Mel Brooks. I knew it was, a, they were satirizing. All the white racists are idiots. Cleavon Little is yeah. above everybody. So, and the movie is hysterical. But yeah, you can't do it now. The difference between... Uh, like I played a Southern, a Strom Thurmond or whatever, Southern care on, on SNL. Yeah, and right. now it would be like, I, as if I'm that guy. <laughs> you know, I, yeah. We've lost our sense of humor they about it. For separate. better or for worse, it's very, it's very serious out there because the stakes are very high between the left and the right and Trump and Biden. It's very... It's just compared to like Clinton versus George Senior, it's like it's so benign. And now it's all toxic. And I, I have to trace it back to social media giving us a platform and tribalism. Talk to that. I don't want to even <laughs> mention what do you think about that? People getting yeah, they, there's, in their bubble. You know. It's like it's the it's a combination. Social media becomes the hall police where a mm. lot of people on social media are just trying to get people mad at each other being like, did you see that? Did you see what he said? Did you see mm, that? Yeah. And kind of poking the bear on that stuff. Um, it's also easier to go backwards and have somebody be like, oh, I dug this thing you did at your comedy that's set weird. in 1993. Yeah, that's weird. That's weird. Um, you have people who are doing stand-up acts. I know they try to take the phones as much as possible, but you know, sometimes when you're, te and I'm not a stand-up, but talk to enough of them like sometimes you're out there you're testing shit and you're trying to figure out what works and what doesn't and where the lines are and mm -hmm. if you're losing that ability that becomes dangerous too i think but uh um, right yeah it's, it's also hard that, to pr pry okay. people's phones out of their hands i mean it's who's right. giving up their phone for two hours you know that's a very tough situation to say you can't talk to your babysitter you can't talk to anyone and and so you have to agree to do that if people are doing it but yeah what you're saying is true. If you want to say jokes that go way too far and then you're going to be judged on that, you're like, this is where we used to practice. And then we go, okay, that one didn't work. Okay, that's too much. But it's already out there now. And they're like, no, oh, that's your favorite joke. And you're like, no, that was a pretend joke right. I'm trying to sharpen. And now I gotta, I'm going to die with it because that's, where do you practice? You know, what do you do? I'm with you. Yeah. yeah. Well, you you want to as comedians mostly just you want to say what you're not supposed to say. It's what pops in your head, <laughs> and sure. uh, to take well, that away. Yeah, and yet we all self censor now. Oh, you, I can't do that. I won't do that. We'll cut that. You know, just do. You you're not even thinking about, it, but you are. Well, I remember the sketch, the Italian restaurant sketch with Kirstie Alley. 
mm-hmm. when you're the maitre d and you're just like <laughs> basically mauling the guests, which the I'm half Italian. Sketch. So I love that because <laughs> Italian restaurants really are actually like that. They're very touchy feely. And so mm-hmm. you went for it. And there's that one part when the camera pans back and he's just got Victoria Jackson with her legs up. And he's like, <laughs> <laughs> and, and then by the end of it, they're just like licking the face and doing all that. I don't even know if, I'm not even positive that would fly now. I don't know. I, I, I just I don't, don't know. It's I like right on the so. line. But it, what I would tell people who have seen it or offended, whatever, is I ask Kirstie Alley, can I, are you okay with this? Yeah, she's amazing in it. And she, like, she like, lets everything course. go. Yeah. 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 Who Some cares? people are there to say whatever. Let, we, let's do anything you want to me and whatever's the funniest and they trust you and then it's way funnier than the people that are stiff and worried about it. That's, that's the yeah. best. And we did it in dress where I go over to the table and Victoria goes back. I have her legs up around my shoulders and I'm talking to everyone sort of. And then <laughs> apparently the censorship people said, hey, d- chill that a little bit. <laughs> but somehow Smigel pretended to, or Rob Schneider, I can't remember, pretended to try to get to me before that. But that was probably once I was in that position in 8H, I go, one of the biggest laughs I've ever been been part of was that but had the to, honor to, to be associated to your with point it. couldn't do it today we're gonna have i don't know if we had already sharon stone there's a oh. sketch that has 16 million on youtube where we are sort of ogling her she's going through airport security <laughs> oh look and i play a man from indonesia or something oh look <laughs> oh can we take you on? and she we're taking her clothes i i i don't know if we'll talk about it with her or whether you were after her, but, um, you know, when it, I remember when I did the pod with Spade, we were talking about SNL, the thing that I always feel like it doesn't get enough credit for, it catches somebody a lot of times at the absolute most famous they ever were at, at mm-hmm. whatever point in their career, but with the guest host, right? Mm-hmm. So you had Sharon Stone on probably like right after basic instinct or right yes. before, and she's the most white hot famous She's ever mm-hmm. going to be like right there, right in that moment. And that's why it's so, it's so funny to see some of the social media accounts that are around SNL, right? About like, they have the ones of just, there's a, there's a Twitter account of just a guest host announcing the musical guest. And sometimes it's really funny because it could be like, there's Steven Seagal, you know, introducing <laughs> oh, the Smashing movies. Pumpkins. Oh, yeah. And it's like, yeah. it's like pop culture Mad Libs, you know, that yeah. like, uh, mm-hmm. There's one Emilio Estevez like saying goodnight and it's Pearl Jam and it's Pearl like Jam, super young yeah. Eddie Vedder and it's like, all right, thanks to Eddie and Pearl Jam. And there's no other pop culture artifact like that. You that- know, someone dug up, Bill, uh, which I saw might have been on Twitter, was uh just rolling at promos, which I didn't know they were rolling when I was there, because they're just rolling and then they're like, and I used to write promos. So yeah. It's me, Emilio, Eddie Vedder, Lauren talking and then going okay and then it's just all the talk in between i would say this i'd hit this we step out of frame they try one hey it's Emilio estevez and pearl jam and then we all walk back into frame and go how'd it go we were a second too long okay take this word out it's riveting for me to go like there's me it's almost like watching that beatles thing where you go there's right. something i didn't know about and they're filming and it just a, a little sliver of time in one of my favorite things in the world and just doing it and just my daily, the boring daily grind of that place. And you go, right. it's so fucking cool. Well, for both of you, it's like all that stuff must be like these random home movies that are in your attic. But meanwhile, like 20 million people have seen them. And they're the dress you know. rehearsal and stuff. We never saw dress on video or we or they have it somewhere because now they're showing clips from SNL from dress and they're showing this and they have a million things backstage and some of the mystery has gone, but uh, it was fun to just, run around backstage there's no security there's no nothing there's no there's people in the hall drunk and friends of friends that are there and phil hartman's going move the fuck out of the way because he's got 90 <laughs> seconds to get right. to his quick change of back and people are drunk going, hey man like i'm at the show but now i think they've got a little more dialed in but that was part of the fun of it I, it's a you know it's there's a surreality to it i always tell people it's a little bit like going back to, to your high school on a Sunday afternoon when no one's around and just walking around the halls, whatever that feeling is. So when I'm there in the 17th floor and I'll be walking along and I'll see me and Phil in a sketch or picture mm-hmm. David, or it's, it's, it's heady stuff because experientially it's, it is the most intense part of one's life or, or right up there, you know, yeah, because of the liveness of it and the legacy of it. That's why I think of cast members, 
who joined this year. You know, I, I was lucky, but I had Eddie and Billy Crystal, Mark Short, that those guys, and then also the original cast, which is like Mount Rushmore for all of us. You know, um, but when but, you when you, you know, showed up, the show was in trouble because it felt like that transition year after the Billy Crystal, uh, that Martin Short and Christopher Guest that year, mm-hmm. and then Lauren came back. He had this young cast, and only a couple of them ended up staying, I think, for the second year. But then mm-hmm. you showed up, and Hartman showed up, and all of a sudden the show is the show is amazing again. Um, but could you feel like? Did it feel like that was a make or break year? Now I feel like I'm interviewing you. Did that feel like a make or break year for the for the <laughs> cast, or did you not even sense that? Well, unless I've misremembered this, but it, Diana Minot, who was Lauren's lieutenant producer, really nice woman. I believe her saying, I, I was told that we had a 10 show commitment. Um, that Bernie 10 Brill, shows. Bernie Brillstein went to Brandon Tartikoff, I think, and just said, You got to give Lauren one more shot, as I remember. So I was told this if we don't hit the ground running, we're, they're going to pull the plug at Christmas. So uh, incredibly nervous anyway. And the first sketch that I did, Madonna came on for my first show and apologized for the 85 season. That was our cold open. Yeah. And then I'm in a sketch with Jan Hooks and Phil and myself. And uh, I just found out recently, I was talking to Robert Smigel and and Jim Jim Downey, and they just said that the audience felt safe with us. And at that moment, because you don't want the audience Mm, to feel nervous for you or not quite sure where the joke's going, you know, you want to get them relaxed. So uh, to come in with them and do that was great. And then when David showed up and Chris Rock, Chris Farley, Sandler, I felt like in those years we were peak, peak all cylinders for for us because we had the the bad boys kicking ass. And then we also still had Phil and... John Lovitz for a year and Dennis and stuff. So that was, I mean, that was, that was the second peak of the show. I feel like the show is in danger in my lifetime. Three times. The first was okay. after the original cast left that Gene Dominion year that you talked mm-hmm. about a little with Piscopo, but mm-hmm. um, it really felt like the, if Eddie, if Eddie isn't there, the show gets canceled. Like that's was just, that the I Robert Downey, Anthony McHall. No, that, that, that was, that was the next one was the, the, uh, so that was season six. Piscopo, but they had Eddie. Gilbert, Kazarinsky. Piscopo and Eddie, they end up keeping. But if they don't yeah. have Eddie, I think the show gets canceled. Yeah. I think mm-hmm. if the Dana, Phil Hartman, that first season doesn't work, I think the show gets canceled. And it really feels like if, if the Will Ferrell that season, if Ferrell's not on the show and the new blood and the people they kept, but then the new people they brought in, if right. that season didn't work, I do wonder if they would have canceled it that year. Because I remember mm-hmm. that. That was back in the day when those magazine profiles, if it was the right kind of hit piece, really mm-hmm. felt like incredibly damaging. And that I remember reading that New York Magazine piece and being like, oh my God, the show's going to get canceled. And then that first episode with Will, he showed up, he did Get Off the Shed, he did the, the phone he thing with Meryl shed. Hemingway, so and it was just funny. like, oh, we're good. This, this guy's amazing. This show's going to be good again. Um, but I, I, after that, I, I never felt like SNL was in danger again after that. Where do you feel? What? How? What, now that you are sort of an expert, what do you feel about yeah. this season and this cast? And the I new mean, people watch and, as much anymore? No, I watch. Uh, I still watch. I still monitor it. Um, <laughs> I, I think they've made the mistake the last decade of too many cast members, which I think you can always trace. It's hard when to get the show to know. is struggling. Yeah, it's when the show is always humming. It's always smaller cast members. And I, I've talked about a bunch of people about this who've worked on the cast. Like mm-hmm. it's like a basketball team. If you if you guys watch basketball, like I do. <laughs> if you're playing 14 players and everybody's playing, you know, 12 to 18 minutes a game, guess what? The team's gonna suck. But if you're if you figure out who like your seven or eight are and you ride those seven or eight, the team's gonna be really good. And I always felt like SNL at its best always had the eights or nine. I, I, I went to Lauren's office like 10 years ago and I got to do mm. a podcast with him, which was amazing. I mean, it was like, honestly, one of the highlights of my career. And I was giving him my basketball theory and his answer was, yeah, mm-hmm. but the new cast members, that's kind of like the draft. And you, it takes so a couple of years for the new cast members Put them to behind have their a veteran. legs. Yeah, and you got to have those guys ready. Mm-hmm. And that's why we have the deeper cast. 
I get it, but I still feel like it should be eight or nine max. I would have been tough on me. I just, I happened to be in like four things on the, on my first episode. I didn't even know what I was doing, but it, it's sink or swim. If you're slow yeah, like motion, that. it's kind of like, if you don't like when, when an NBA player gets traded and he, and then he comes in with a new team with a new system and he gets into his rhythm. He's fits with the system. All of a sudden he's scoring 20 points. He's a different basketball player. But if you coming off the bench constantly and the offense isn't running through you, the same thing with SNL, if you can't get your reps in and get rid of the fear, not all of us are Eddie Murphy, who I thought was a, right. a savant, you know, at 19, but mo even Will Ferrell, everybody gets better the more they're out there. And then the audience also discovers you gets comfortable with you. So I, I, it's, it's, it's pick your poison. I don't think, you know, I, Lauren, you know, it's his show. He's 50 years. I, he, he has a method to what everything he thinks of everything. So I guess this is, um, how it, how it works. You get to be on the show, but you may have, we, we didn't have anyone not in the show when I was there it was seven cast members. Right. So everybody was in every show, but now a lot of times, oh, I wasn't in it for two weeks. It's like survivor. Yeah. Because there's people that just, if you don't make it, and then, and then they sometimes add, but don't subtract. So now you add this person because you got to cover like a leading man type. You know, they, there's sometimes there's types. I never got that back then. But sometimes you need to fill a Phil Hartman role. Sometimes you need to fill this kind of guy. And, and then um, if you don't do or just adding now, suddenly it's just too many to keep track of. It's just hard for them. They go bananas. But then if they leave, where do you go? I remember I was going to leave a year earlier. And then they're like, what do we have lined up? Because it's always easier to get work when you're on SNL and then right. had a movie almost every summer. And then, uh, you leave and luckily God on just shoot me, but that, that, that doesn't always happen. So what do you do when you go? And so you just sometimes just stick it out and there's people there sticking out longer than we used to. I stayed six years and that was considered a hair long. Um, Sandler, uh, Farley rock was three Sandler and Farley were four or five, no five. So, I stayed one year too long and I was like the fucking guy that went to college that came back to high school because it was Will and Sherry and I was like, I liked <laughs> them, but I didn't, I immediately felt like, oh no, all my guys are gone and I don't know what to do with this. I don't. And so I just did one, Lauren goes, stay and you can do one segment a week, do whatever you want. And I didn't do sketches. I just did one segment a week of whatever I wanted. And that was like my own kind of update. So that was where the Terry Hatcher thing was. Sean Penn gave me a tattoo. I thought that really worked. Yeah, I th I it was fun. That it, it, it's it was fun, because, but you have one swing to get it right. I went to the World Series, did a field piece to the Braves with Chipper Jones and some people. So, you know, some of those came out pretty funny. But after that, I said, no, I think it's time to boogie. And uh, and then I forgot where this question started. <laughs> well, I mean, part of it is about how you build the cast, right? And yeah. Everyone says the same thing. You have to have that one glue person, mm. you know, and then that was you Phil. could argue about who the greatest glue person was. It's probably Phil. Phil Hartman. Phil and Aykroyd. Yeah, Aykroyd's in there. I think there was a moment where Sudeikis and Hater together mm. were like <laughs> just co literally covering every possible glue thing you would ever want. <laughs> and and um, Fred, Fred Armisen, too. Right. Those, those three. Guys are it's always superstars. amazing that you get these new peaks after Will Ferrell. And then um, we asked um, Keenan Thompson, who's your MVP or whatever? And he said, the women <laughs> of the last 20 years. Yeah, and I do it. think there were complaints about misogyny in terms of casting. And Nora, Nora Dunn had some complaints about it. Yeah. Um, and boy, starting with, I don't know, Sherry O'Terry through Tina, and I, I'll miss all the name, Maya and and Amy Polar, you know, it's just Kristen and then, Kate. and then Kate yeah. and, um, yeah, but you know what though? I, didn't, I never thought others. that was totally fair because I always felt like Jane hooks was one of the best cast members of that entire generation ever. Yeah. ever. And yeah. she, and they're always like, Oh, it wasn't till this when, and it was like, man, I, I thought I know, it's, like, it's taking it away from her a little bit because she yeah, was, so I thought good. I, yeah. I mean, to, to me, she's in the running of one of the best female cast members in the history oh, of the show. Yeah. yeah. And I, I think and she's I think in the top five. Yeah, a male. You would women were not running for president. I mean, the, Sarah Palin came on the scene, and there was Tina Fey meeting that. Yeah, but in, in the era I was in, it was mostly men politically. There were other figures, yeah. but so that sort of evolved as well. Obviously, Hillary became a big, a big thing. But um, 
Yeah, Jan Jan Hooks, I don't know if it, I wouldn't call her underrated because everybody knows, but if you really take a deep dive in, into her work, she was one of those what can't she do, you know? Bill, who's your who's your starting five if you took out the original cast? That's that's they're too good. They don't count. And take us out. Yeah, take right. us out. <laughs> He's um, like, you don't have to worry about that. <laughs> Yeah, no, I got I, that. I, Dana's got a real Dana Mount Rushmore. Dana is very He's got close. a legitimate Mount Rushmore case. He's, he really he's does. Got, I really have to say I'll down. give it to Dana. Uh, okay, take Dana out. I so, get people who think I, um, I'm just, I'm an impressionist, like Rich Little, when I meet him at airports and stuff. You did the best <laughs> impressionist. And I go, well, I, but what about Church Lady and Garth? And they go, oh, that's kind of flattering. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> I think... Uh, I think Hartman and Eddie and um, yeah. Farrell, yeah, just all the all the different stuff they could do. They just yeah. had it like it's almost like instead of just naming five, it's almost like who can't be left out. And that's I think you have to hard. mention those three, and you have to mention Dana. Um, you have to mention Dana. I have. And if you're if you're pulling the original, if you're if you're saying that's off limits, that's tough for me because I think Gilda was the best female cast member they ever had, mm. and it's not a popular opinion because it was a hundred million years ago and people barely remember it. But man, if you go back and you look at all the stuff she did, she was so good, so talented, so famous that she had her own Broadway show. Like, yeah, how many yeah. cast members in the history of SNL could be like, "You're so good at this." We're gonna have a show called Gilda Live, and you're gonna do all your characters. It's like impossible. <laughs> I'm so, not gonna uh, fight Young Gilda. Yeah, I, I mean, no, Gilda, I, I, I mean, really all, all these the girls, women. the women today, will probably be like, they looked up to Gilda. I'm sure, like we looked up to different. I looked up to Gilda too. I mean, geez, I would watch her, and I didn't realize how hard what she was doing was. Mm -hmm. I would see characters and just think that was the people, and then later go, "Oh, they're doing different." <laughs> I don't know what was going on. You know, I actually thought uh, the last twenty years, I thought Maya Rudolph. Was the was the my favorite female cast member? Um, I thought yeah, she I, could do the most. I thought I just thought she was incredibly talented. I know she's she has like four or five kids. Like I like she's definitely gone the family direction a little bit. But oh yeah, I think she was like. I I just thought like she was one of those. She could literally do anything. Well, it's almost um, like you could make yeah. three three or four packs for people. Like just sure, Ma Maya, you could, Amy. You could do top twenty. You could do top. Yeah, 50. and then you, and then you have Armisen and Sudeikis and and Bill Hader, maybe the best. Ever, you know, so it's it's yeah. it's just a it's a fun game. It's a way to celebrate the show. For me, my thought about Gilda is the charisma and the likability was was at the, the, the highest I'd ever seen. Of any cast member, I mean, there was, she was a, a an adorability thing about her. She's playing a little girl on a bed. It's an in, just herself. She's right. so committed. It just there was just this uh, kind of other level of of likability or adorability, whatever quotient you want to call it. Who do you have as your number one? I, maybe you're too close to this and can't answer. But number one weekend update. Well, I have to uh, bifurcate them in a way, like yeah. Like Chevy was the original. And so when I'm watching that show, um, he was just no wonder he, he he's a movie star. You know, he's like he was such so a good great. vibe to watch Chevy. Yeah, everything and was funny, everything was exciting, it was fun to watch. Dennis Dennis did six years solo. That's why I don't, you know, when you had Tina and, and Jimmy Fallon and stuff, it is a different kind of idea. I do think the current to uh Michael. And Colin, I have a great chemistry. They're they're getting even mm -hmm. better and looser. They're tricking each other. Yeah. So I think they're really as good as it gets. I so, like but, their chemistry. But for too. a solo, you know, night after night, I've never been around. And David would, uh, you know, Dennis is just such a brilliant joke writer, um, mm -hmm. and he's a machine. <laughs> but yeah. so I would put him up there as the uh, solo. I mean, Norm Norm only did two years. You know, it's different, right? Yeah. It was, it was yeah. Two years. Norm also had a a thing you couldn't take your eyes off of him, you know, when he was doing update. That smile, the dimples. I mean, he was like, he looked like a movie star. He never played right. into it, but he looked like a full-blown movie star, yeah. especially in that era. And then the the turns that his jokes would take. I don't know what you call it, David, that style of his. Like, OJ's uh, not doing too well because he kills people. Or whatever right. it was, you know. The pauses. Yeah. Pauses and like this really bold 
turn. So he's, it's fun to Michael talk Jackson about Michael Jackson says things. he'll never get married, mostly because he's gay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> right. and then, but they let <laughs> him comes. do it. And yes. then you, it's just hard to compete with that because that's just in a world of, you weren't canceling people, he would have been canceled. I mean, there, there's so many things he said, and then he doesn't stand up. Or he, he was uncancelable. People, I didn't, maybe he, he might have been uncancelable. Yeah, cared. no, no, he doesn't care. And, and even later in his career, he would just do gigs, and people come, they know what they're getting. So, but yeah, to, can I just talk to that for a second? Because Norm's, um, I, he wasn't stoned, but he his eyes were all sparkly, and he had yeah. a grin on his face. I saw him go on the View once with Barbara Walters and everyone. And they're just talking about presidents or something. And he gets into a casual thing, just soft selling it with that grin of his. Yeah, the Clintons, right? I mean, you know, they, uh, they're they good. I, I think I like them, but uh, I, I think they they kill they killed a guy, right? <laughs> You know, like, they kill the, too many the people. Guy. That's one they, they, problem. And Barbara Walters didn't under didn't know who he was. It was just a comedian getting booked. Like, what, are you, like, wait, what? What, what, what are you? Wait, what? What are you? What? what are you saying? Hey, now that I think you're really great, right? <laughs> but uh, so his soft pedaling, he was almost like a country guy at, at, out in the Outsider, out in the town yeah. square or something. So you, it, you, they never landed hard in like a ah, way with Norm. That was also I part have, of his. I thought Dennis was the best. But at Norm, Norm was my favorite. Okay, and well, that's I don't good. know. I just felt like I didn't know if everyone was in on Norm. I didn't know anything. I'm living in Boston. We don't have the internet yet. I don't know how popular mm -hmm. it is. But I just knew like me and my friends, we were like, this guy's probably getting fired soon. Let's just enjoy yeah. this for the, for the <laughs> 10 to 20 <laughs> weeks. This and is going to exist. <laughs> <laughs> um, did, did he originate fake news or was that someone else? Did Norm say, and how's the Here's fake the news? Fake yeah, news. I think he did. Yeah. Okay. yeah, he also, he did the note to self. Another interesting argument yes. that I, <laughs> yeah. people always have the same SNL arguments. Nobody has the, who are the best five people to just pop next to the weekend update guy for four minutes. Oh, for bits. Combo. Because that was Belushi. Wait, like, that was one of the things he didn't get enough credit for when he would come in and he would do different things. But he would what do are the guy his that got Excuse me, I can't. He would do the one where he would just get super mad and end up with the butt no, and then he'd go flying off oh, the stage. Like no. I feel like he was the first one that oh, was like yeah. got crazy, throwing uh, his body. Eddie around. was yeah. Eddie That's was unbelievable. That's a, Eddie became yeah. famous, and then Sandler probably hit the hardest of anybody. Yeah, because he could do the characters, he could do the songs. Like when he did the the first time he did the Hanukkah song, like you go back and watch that clip. Like people lose their fucking minds. Like it's like he's yeah. <laughs> Leonard Skinner singing Freebird. They, he's a professional singer. It's happening. unreal. Yeah, Along it's with jokes, which is very rare, and he's cute. And then uh, I remember Opera when he Man. did Crazy Spoonhead. He did all the uh, Halloween things. Oh, yeah. Killing. Yeah, and just just commitment. I mean, Adam has that whatever whatever he has. He's got it. You know, he, super super likable charm. Yeah, and um, Hater, I think, is up there, too, for just popping on. Kate McKinnon was really good at it, just coming on, playing mm -hmm. some crazy character. But it is like its own little skill set, because you, it's like you're a basketball player. You're just coming in, and you have to make like five threes in two minutes to get out of the game. Yep. Yeah, you yeah. did it. I mean, that's how you broke in, right, with uh, sitting next to I Dennis I think Miller. I was doing like little Hollywood minutes. Oh, that's, what, that's all that was. Yeah, I yeah. guess I would come in and do those. But- even if I did anything, I talked about going to concerts or whatever, you're sitting on a desk in the dark and you're like, and you know it's coming to you, which joke, and then you slide in and the cue cards, they point and they go like, you're up after this one. And you're like, because you're in the dark and no one's really looking at you and you slide over and then there's 20 million people, like they see you. And it, even when you walk by, you go, I can just run in front of that camera right now. Right. I guess that's a trust it, issue. It is like a <laughs> rodeo, a rodeo thing. Because I remember one time you're in, you're in, you're on deck, and you're in the darkness, yeah. and the show's all lit up, and there's laughs and rah rah. And I think it was Chris Rock was before me or something. So yeah. I see his hair, his chair rolls out, and he does his thing. Then I'm in the shoot, and it is you have to go from just darkness and crew guys around you to being on, you know. So there's. There is but Dana, of, what about when you do, you do a good one and it kills and then you kind of scoot yourself and then Piscopo, uh, I mean, uh, Joe Dixo pulls you off or whoever. <laughs> Joe and, then, yeah, and then you're in the uh, dark and you're just walking behind like a Gap Girl set and no one's even looking at you and you're like, your adrenaline's going, 
but the show's still going over here. <laughs> and you sort of walk back to the yeah. underneath to maybe snag a few compliments <laughs> from Lauren and the well, producers watching the Well, you try to look at some monitor. of the audience members and they avoid eye yeah. contact. And then you go back <laughs> where it's lit by your dressing room to change. And you're like, anybody? Did it go good? Did it go bad? Like Another good category is the the Mount Rushmore or whatever of people who weren't even the focal point of the sketch, but somehow were still the funniest person in the sketch, oh, which yeah. is like, to me, Chris Farley is number one. Um, oh yeah. Has to like be. he's in the yeah. dysfunctional family feud. Yeah, 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 yeah. He, he's he's <laughs> yeah. just like the loser kid who Hartman's been mean to. And he's probably yeah. like the fifth most important, but every single thing he does in the thing is hilarious. Um, and then at the end, he runs out and starts kicking to the left and right. I just saw that the other day. I go, what a moron. I remember walking at rehearsal. I go, you're not really doing that. He goes, oh, yeah. <laughs> you were on the other side. You were in the normal family. Yeah, I watch him. Yeah, we were. I think we were the normal family, right? He, uh, Chris was, you know, there was so much uh, intellect behind all that. You knew him much better than I did, David. But his rhythms and sounds and moves that he would, uh, you know, like, I mean, it just, they were so concise and, you could not not laugh. Like when he would do his kind of fake laugh, like he would turn into a hog, you know, just yeah. around the office. You'd like, this is irresistibly funny. But yeah, yeah. He, he was, uh, your eye went to him, anything he was in. I once did Ross Perot riding him like he was a piggy. Come on, piggy boy. Let's go, <laughs> piggy boy. And I was going, Chris, is this okay with you? And he goes, oh yeah, do whatever you want. You know, I'm whipping and stuff. I know other people get mad there. You can't do that to Chris. No, Chris he wasn't was like, mad. No, no, do it. I'll do whatever you want. I don't care. I think it's funny. So how he would is, never kill a bit. So we're headed for the 50th year. Yeah. Next year. I know. Yeah. Which I think is really good for your podcast because, you know, it's it, the fact that the show's been around for a half century is. What do they do, Bill? What wild. is this? Lauren Kinda leave? Who takes stunning. over? It's stunning and bizarre. I can't even fathom fathom it. Fiftieth. Um, <laughs> I think I I'm guessing Lauren's going to leave, and I'm guessing somebody major has to take over the show. Somebody with real DNA with someone it, NBC would approve. Everyone would have like, to approve. It's I I just feel like it's Tina or it's Seth if he wants to do it, mm -hmm. and it's got to be somebody on that level who has that kind of chops. They're not just be like, hey, we hired Bob. He's been a huge fan of the show. He'll be taking over for Lorne Michaels. Like I I don't see that happening. I feel like yeah, the person's got to have DNA. Yeah, we brought him yeah. over from Hallmark, and they they would yeah. have to they would be warned ahead of time that you, half the time you're miserable. I mean, it's it's a tough show. Not every show crushes there was just a yeah. lot of shows in my era where the party's a little grim and didn't really land it that night you know because that's why there's no other sketch shows because the the ratio of success to failure and a quick hit sketch yeah but right. i i do think the fact that it's live they tried to take that away in the 90s they said let's make it taped and we gotta change the theme and lorne to his credit always resisted somehow he knew about too. branding yeah. Before maybe that was become such a thing people talk about. Stuck with that theme. Everything's familiar. And that's why we can interview cast members. We talked to Mikey Day yesterday. You're right. Uh, he's on today. And uh, we know everything. We told him that. We know the offices you're in. We know Lauren's there. It's still, but Lauren might just stay a few more years. I don't know. I, I've, yeah, who knows? Like the Patriots are going through this now. Bill Belichick just left yeah. and they hired a new coach and he's got a new coaching staff. And there's been a lot yeah. of stories about, whoa, things are so different. And, oh, the coach talked to the media today and, oh my God, they have this, you know, they're changing this part of the office and it's going to be this now. And everybody's like, cause Belichick was there for 20 plus years. Yeah. And just any kind of change feels like the most substantial change ever. So I can't even imagine with SNL if somebody else came in and was like, Hey, I thought of an idea. We're going to merge two offices and make it one big eye. People are like, what? Right, they, right, you can't do right. that. That's It's been that way yeah. for 50 years. And, you know, I don't the, know how you do that. You, the, maybe Tina and Seth could make one Lauren. I don't know. I mean, they, they would. Lauren is very good politically with the, the new regime as Universal, whoever he is, or whoever the head of the network. He's really good at doing that. And how do you navigate all these cast members? Um, kind of Game of Throning each other, <laughs> even even if they love each other, it's still just your friend gets. So I don't know. It's really and, hard. And to Lauren imagine knows it. all the celebrities too, so Lauren can call someone and say, maybe Steve Martin would be good in this. Let's call him. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, and but that's the thing that has the, to be able to be dialed in. The new iteration of the show, I don't feel like should be celebrity dependent. I would go back to what the roots of the show were and go to cast members and a guest host, but not be celebrity dependent because yeah. celebrity and pop culture is part of the, what they should be. You know, I, I felt that. Yeah. And we talked about it earlier uh, yesterday when the podcast was a, long, a while back. But yeah, when a celebrity would come in and then in my era, someone from the cast would do that impression. I just thought it was dispiriting, you know, um, for the cast. Right. And right. we had. Yeah, so I, I do think this I'm going to say it. The secret sauce. One of them is is watching a young performer come in, male, female, watching them trundle along and then become a star you're you're in real time you're experiencing it with them and that is still the magic elixir of an unknown person being thrown out there you know and you want so. those impressions to have some bite and it, and you want to have some edge to it and it's just hard if they're a friend of the show friend of the show and so you got to stay away from some people you can't do this politically yeah, like you, you could argue they should be having so much fun with taylor swift and travis kelsey right like that should be yeah, I'm think sure about if won't. those people yeah. existed in the late seventies or in the late eighties, Sure, that would have been fodder for the show every week. But now I feel like they'd be a little afraid mm. because, Oh no, mm. she won't want to come back on if we make fun of her. And I, like the other piece of it is Good point. why is the show live at this point? If there's no danger that comes with being live. Cause right. Cause the reason, the whole reason they had the show in the first place was this is live. Anything can mm-hmm. happen. Yeah. Any line might get crossed. Somebody might yeah. swear accidentally. All these crazy things could happen. Now it's like a safe live, which I don't, at this point, like, <laughs> I, I don't know why you just wouldn't tape the show at eight o'clock and air it safe at 1130. Fun. It's not like, oh my God, what's going to happen? Yeah. I don't, do you feel like that anyone might change feels that way anymore? The 50th. Maybe. Uh, it would be better. I mean, when you can have two takes on something like on a movie, you're definitely better. Some sketches you come off on the wrong foot. And you're like, oh my God, we came in wrong and it's just not clicking. You can't and you're save like, just, it. Yeah. I want to step back and go, let me just come in again. And then you're like, it's too late. It's not, it's not working. And when then it when something uh, like when Ross Perot's running mate, Adam, Admiral Stockdale <laughs> right. came out and he, and he was kind of goofy. <laughs> and then like three days later, Phil's doing that and I'm doing pro and we have the car. And that was just what the show does best, better than anyone when it happens is the zeitgeist is all there. And, and, but now you've got to compete with things like this, everything, and then you hit it and it's this relief valve. And that's when the show is magic. And I think in the modern era with all the different people doing different kind of comedy takes all the time, it is more difficult, but that's still, when it happens, it's, it's, it's great. It's great. Well, it's going to be interesting when Shane hosts at the end of this month. Yeah. You know, why, they, why do you, why do you think so, Bill? Why, what do you think? You know, well, yeah, I, know. I think there's going to be real danger, you know, well, and it's I'm like, holy kidding, shit, yeah. I don't know what's going to happen. And that's a show I want to watch live. That's more about him than the show. But, um, you know, and I also think he's one of the funniest people working right now. Well, so. we, we, we mentioned that when we, we talked just casually that time, the, uh, he, he's the guy right now, you know, and, yeah. uh, he, his take it's, it's, it, it's just, uh, you, you just want to listen to him. And going back to the show and how he how he got fired, it, that's that's an example of a live show where you want to see it. Like, how is how are they going to handle it? The show and how is Shane going to handle it? So I'm sure they're thinking about different things. But usually, when the show's at its best, it's going to go right at it. You know, like maybe him and Bo and Yang will be in a rowboat somewhere. I don't know, but they usually go right at it. Right. <laughs> you know. Bill, I have a uh, don't get mad. I have a sports question. Yeah, let's go. Don't get mad. I know how you, I know your temper. Um, <laughs> My temper. <laughs> because people ask me this. I'm kidding. He doesn't have a temper. Um, is football allowed to be rigged? I know people say it's football rigged, but then they also say it's entertainment or NBA. Is that stuff allowed to fudge and twist because it's an entertainment company instead of just sports? I don't really get that. Are you saying could the Super Bowl have been scripted because Kansas City won and they won an overtime and Taylor Swift and her boyfriend kissed after the game? That's part a, of it and how, how, beneficial, how beneficial that is. Or even I thought I saw a thing with Shaquille. I see basketball players sometimes online saying, oh yeah, we're told the finals will be this long and who, who wins. And Shaq saying when he got 
drafted, David Stern said to him, where do you want to play, hot or cold? And he said, I want to play somewhere hot. And he goes, okay. And then the day of the draft, he goes, it'll be Orlando. And then he's so saying this. Th and yeah, he goes- That's a famous story. Yeah. I mean, that's I so weird. I never that. heard that story. And I go, I is that- So the, are the ping pong balls really bouncing around? Or is it, you know, I don't know. It, it, it makes me think all this stuff. And then the defense is, we're an entertainment company. We don't have to play exactly by the rules. And you go, oh- like a movie, like we uh, we have to make it fun to watch. Yeah, I don't I don't think they can rig the games, but I used to write about this all the time. I you know it's same thing like how you guys would do impressions of people. I would always play up certain things and have fun with it. One mm -hmm. of them was that David Stern, the old NBA commissioner, was you know this like basically Vito Corleone and rigging all sure. this stuff. And there was always this thing about when Patrick Ewing went to the Knicks. It was the mm -hmm. first time they ever had the lottery. There were seven em envelopes. And he's reaching down and he grabs each one. And if you look briefly for like a split, split second, it looked like the next one had a little bit of a crease on one of the sides. Ah, I felt and it. Then there was a theory that they had frozen the envelope. So as he's feeling the envelope that was frozen, ah, that was the one that's he picked. great. And it was like, you know, whatever, like they just put it in like a carbon, whatever. So it was like freezing cold when he touched it. So he knew that was the one. But that was always a, a uh, recurring bit about him. Same thing when, <laughs> when Jordan got suspended or when Jordan retired, there was always a thing. Oh no, actually Jordan got suspended for a year. The Shaq thing, that was always a story. Mm. Um, there was stuff they did in the late 90s, early 2000s where the perfect team for the league and the ratings always seemed to win. And that, mm. like most famously, it was a Philly versus Milwaukee, Allen Iverson. They're trying to get him mm. into the finals of 2001 playing Milwaukee. Mm. And Philly shot like a hundred more free throws than Milwaukee in the series. Yeah, there was the Kings Lakers game, which I'm sure you guys remember, 2002, where um, if the Kings win Game Six, they win the series. Everyone on the Kings fouled out. So you see stuff like that. I do think they can kind of nudge the officials to say, "Hey, man, we don't like how you know Shaq is being defended when they do this. You got to call it." And then they start calling it yeah. early and the other team's like, wait, we were doing that last game. That's a foul now. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there's because been some they fun can't conspiracy tell stuff. Players that are spend their whole life playing as hard as they can to get with there. It's just hard to, to buy. You're going to tell players not to play hard. But then you see like, oh, I, you watch all these, like, which I would never see a lot of chiefs, uh, no holding calls. And then they just show over and over holding and you go. So, I mean, they, the right. refs can't see everywhere, but sometimes if they want to, they can always find a hold somewhere because it's kind oh, of, I mean, that's the Patriots going 19 easy. and zero and the helmet catch where if you mm -hmm. watch the helmet catch, like four guys are holding for Eli because he buys like an extra four, four seconds <laughs> four and there's just holding all over the people are just getting mauled and the refs are yeah. like, cool. And that was yeah. the year we had Spygate for the Patriots and, you know, mm -hmm. the, the commissioner's office was against them. So the Patriots fans have always felt like that game was. What's the, what's the penalty rate per game right now? Because it seems like when I watch the NFL, there's an incredible play. And then I immediately go looking for the flag. Yeah, yeah, flag? yeah, yeah. Flag? Pop up. Oh, yeah. a flag! I mean, uh, the best play I've ever seen. So yeah. I do think if you're going to rig uh, professional sports and you want to kind of nudge it, that would be your way to do it without getting caught. That was when the, when gambling, sports gambling really took off the last 15 years. One of the first edges the best gamblers had was the referee tendencies. Yeah, And this was uh -huh. in NBA and NFL specifically, where it was like, oh, this, this team, they call more penalties and more penalties means, yeah. you know, this will happen. And this is the same thing with NBA. If somebody's more foul happy, then the over is going to hit more. And oh, now right. all that stuff's kind of on the internet and people know it, but when they assign ga certain refs to certain playoff games, then people are like, oh, of course they assign that ref. He always calls it for the road team. And so that stuff's out there. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's fun. Some people take it very seriously. Well, when I'm losing millions every week on DraftKings, it's how'd you do? How'd it. you do in the playoffs, Spade? Uh, in the play, I do DraftKings, but I also do a, uh, Fan duel. I get with some guys <laughs> and do like uh, fantasy or guillotine leagues or weird stuff like that just to keep the fun going up until the end. And uh, I do okay in those. I'm not that great. It's just some, it's a good time killer. I'm in the fantasy league with uh, Jimmy's cousin and John Hamm and all those people where it's 11 people in the league, but the winner gets to vote somebody out of the draft the next year, which I think <laughs> is the single best rule. So, so we have to show up. Rude. We have to show up. 
And then <laughs> the guy who won is like, all right, uh, Dana, I'm sorry, you're out. And you just have to get your stuff and leave. And that's it. We don't see you for a year. Yeah, it's great. It's really, really, it gets super bitter. And you keep going lower and lower with people or do you add a person? No, it's the same 11, but we we have 10 people in the league every year, plus the guy who got voted out. Oh, 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 so it's even. So they get to come back a year later. They can't get voted out, but then somebody else gets voted out. It has to be even, Dana. You don't understand. I just, (laughs) I'm going to ask you guys a question. I mean, I felt like, I felt beat up after I watched the Super Bowl. Yeah, I don't think yeah. I've ever gotten that beat up. I'm from Bay Area, so I'm a Niner fan, but I I like the Chiefs too. I'm not fanatical, but I was rooting for them. But there was some frustration and penalties, and it was and the way it ended, I was like, yeah, ah, it wasn't satisfying. And if you're a Chiefs fan, I guess it was, but it was yeah. like that new fifth quarter. I I wasn't paying attention to that. It never been in the you know in the uh, Super Bowl that I wasn't new briefed rules either. for the overtime. <laughs> you were confused. And, it was mm. it was one of those things people wrote about it, but nobody actually thought it was going to happen. So then, yeah. when it was happening, there was so much strategy to it that none of us had really totally considered. And the Niners ended up choosing to go first. But I, I was saying this week, to me, it's like going second was such an advantage because you become the blackjack dealer. It's the other guys going first, you know exactly what they're going to do, yeah. and then you can decide what you need to do. To match whatever they did, sure, which yeah, is the advantage. But I yeah. don't think we realized that until we watched it. Because if you get a touchdown, you're not just going for two, probably, because you yeah. could win with a touchdown with an extra point. The Chiefs said and, that and they said that they the were scoring, they were getting two. They, they, yeah, they were, were going to come gonna back try and to go for two. the game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I told I my agree. wife it was over. I said, "Oh no, Mahomes got the ball. They're going to do four downs. They moved back so fucking easily when they came back. I was like, "Oh, it's no. going to be prevent defense, just and then it was just so predictable." Yeah. When it, one team is playing three downs punt, and or they did get the field goal, and the other team is going to go four mentally yeah. uh, to move the ball. So, Well, and then there's this inevitability with him, which I think all the best athletes have, well, where that's, when the door is open like that, you're like, oh, here we go. Do you think he yeah. could host SNL, Patrick Mahomes? Uh, he's kind of he's quirky. Yeah, I don't I get you know, I, I, know. I, I, think, I think I could host it. You know, I mean, we, 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 we did the game we thought we were doing. I'm a little stutter. <laughs> that was pretty good. I, oh, I, I like worked. that. Oh, I'm sure everybody does it on, you know. No, that um, was, I haven't heard a lot of Mahomes. That was good. I haven't heard. It's hard. It's like Pee Wee Herman. Uh, uh, yeah, I don't know it's easier about my voice. Oh, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm doing Bobcat Goldthwait, but that's okay. <laughs> Bobcat <laughs> Goldthwait <laughs> as Pat Mahomes. As Pat Mahomes. <laughs> But yeah, he's a supernatural talent, uh, a word I like to use a lot. You know, he can what, host what can you for say? sure. Well, well I know, you asked yeah. me about athlete host. I thought Kelsey was was actually really good last year or two years ago, whenever he did it. I thought he was solid. Um, I think, I I think he'd be an actor. He's with CAA. There's a master plan. I, I, I love it. It's just to make him into an international movie star. And he probably has the the looks and the charisma to do that. It's just kind of, the rock did it and was open about it. You know, Um, I'm ready for action stars again. I I feel like we're in such a weird spot. Like the, the era I grew up with where we had Arnold and we had Sly, we had then Van Damme showed up and (laughs) Seagal and all these dudes. And we just, there was a new one every year. And we had like this embarrassment of riches. Carl Weathers had a chance. Yep. Um, Had a chance. And now it's like, (laughs) it's all these Jason Statham guys. They know how to do this like choreographed Kung Fu stuff. And I don't know. I miss the days of just like these big dudes that we can kind of make fun of on a show like SNL. I like Seagal. I thought he was great. I thought he, those those movies His first five were great. Oh yeah, he's great. I was a legendary bad host though. Anybody seen Rick Ritchie? (laughs) In the pool hall scene, one of the great scenes in the movies. (laughs) Anybody seen Ritchie? Anybody? (laughs) He always, yeah, he always played Italian dudes. He played like Nico Peretti and people like that. Even though yeah, he was I, 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 I didn't even know what that meant when I was a kid. I just kept going, you better kick his fucking ass too. And yeah. there's like eight guys and he walks in and starts being a dick. And I go, once in my life, I just want to be this guy. Just go up to a bunch of guys that are looking at me and go, the fuck are you looking at? Just for right. once. And then no, beat the shit out of all he of them. Was, he was Steven Seagal when he, when he hosted yeah. the show as far as just this alpha male presence and stuff. And talking about how he could choke anyone out or beat anyone up, just yeah, uh, he was the Wasn't perfect he guy. The, he was the legendary reviled host, though, from your generation, right? Wasn't he the least favorite? 
you know, there's others I wouldn't mention. I, I, I kind of, yeah. I liked him. Um, <laughs> I, I did too. He, I, I it's hard to him, act tough when you ask for a scrunchie because I found him fascinating. <laughs> You'd go by the dressing room during the week and you'd hear a woman in a state of pleasure. It was just really interesting, you know? Oh my God. Yeah. What a lover that guy was. I guess so. But uh, he was just fun to talk to. What a trip. But he, you know, he, he was a little offended by Hans and Franz. We had to rewrite it because he thought we were making fun of him in the read through. And then we rewrote it so that you could beat up Arnold. You're the only one who could beat up Arnold. <laughs> you know, so. But I like the guy. I don't know. I like, I like anyone, there, There's worse hosts, but you can't really name everybody. It's just too rude to name them. No one's going to do that, you know? Yeah, that becomes aggregated. It's like the yeah, Daily Mail. They, they, David Spade said so-and-so yeah, is the Yeah, they quote it for the rest of your host. life. Yeah. yeah. But Marcy Klein told us that she was the wrangler of hosts over the years and producer. Hi, Marcy. And she, Lauren would say, uh, so-and-so was in their dressing room. They're not coming out. So she would have to go in there and they'd be crying. And the show's on in four minutes or, or, or just having a panic uh, attack. Yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, you kind of have some empathy for the host. They're doing something that's impossible, you know? Yeah. You know, one of the things, because I loved all the books. Like I read, there's this great book that came out, I'm going to say mid-80s. The, it's called, I think live from Saturday night or something yeah. like that, mm-hmm. but it's about the first 10 years of the show. And, and it was one of my favorite books. And then the oral histories came out with Jim Miller and shales and a bunch of other stuff, but you'd read the history of the show and these things that happen, never expecting YouTube's coming and all these other things where you could actually just go back and watch. So there was always that mm-hmm. legendary story of Belushi when he was so fucked up, he couldn't go, you know, basically couldn't start. It was that, I think when Kate Jackson hosted, and they were like, it's 50-50 whether he, he he could die in the air if you put him on Lauren. And Lauren's like, I'll take those chances and <laughs> yeah. puts him on. And uh. he's in the first sketch. So I've always read that story. And then you watch the clip and it's like, eh, Belushi seems he's, fine. He's like fine. He's a little, yeah. he's a tiny bit green, but it's, it doesn't seem like he's going to die during it the sketch. It sounds better. Yeah. Yeah. It's so sometimes the, the video doesn't match up whatever the, uh, the, the story folklore. Was. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Dana, and we gotta yes. we gotta uh, wrap up Bill, but anything else you have something good for Bill? Any it can be sports, it doesn't have to be, it can be anything. Well, I love sport. Well, you know, I'm a big uh like a lot of people now, but I, I was with the Warriors mentally with Nate Thurman and Rick Barry. Oh, uh, look at you. <laughs> and uh so I've always been a fan of the Warriors, and of course this era with Steph is is amazing. I guess the rumor today they're trying to get, which they're not going to get LeBron, are they? Yeah, it it didn't happen. The, it didn't the happen trade already. deadline was last yeah. week, and I, um, and then it mysteriously got leaked today that the Warriors tried to trade for LeBron, and yeah. the Lakers said no, and LeBron didn't want to go there. So obviously the Lakers are leaking this because the Warriors are playing better. And they have good chemistry. And it's like, oh, actually, they were trying to trade a bunch of you for LeBron. And Get in their heads. Trying. Yeah. So it, it felt, a little, I thought, a little diabolical. Get brawny. Yeah. Oh, they were trying to get LeBron, but we said no. It's like, all right, I'm maybe. Don't you have to get the kid to get brawny? To get, I mean, get brawny to get LeBron? Well, the, the kid's had a rough freshman year in college. Yeah. So oh. I'm, not, I'm not sure he's hopping Ooh, into the draft sore right sub. away. sub. Yeah, it's a okay. tough one. He's like five okay. points a game at USC. So Okay, this is my last hard. question because I know yeah. you're a movie fanatic as well because you yeah. do the re- rewatches. Um, I, I don't like, forget top 10, whatever. Movies that you can revisit throughout your life. Oh, yeah. So you, like, you know, I see The Godfather every year but pretty much. You know, there's there's ones that you just see a lot of, you know. So for me, Heat was the movie that started the rewatchables because we did on my podcast, we just, it was the 20th anniversary and me and my friend, Chris Ryan, we're just like, let's just do a podcast about Heat. Fuck it. People loved it. So we created the rewatchables. What do you want to do? That was the first time Pacino went full scream, which is amazing. Pacino oh, is crazy in that movie. I, Pacino has explained it after that he's playing the character like the guys on cocaine. Yeah. And oh, it's like, yeah. yeah, we know. We saw Heat. We 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 know that's what you're doing. <laughs> uh, he's like, she's got a great ass. <laughs> um, a great but, uh, ass. But Heat Heat's up there. <laughs> Same time. Um, Go ahead. And then uh, Boogie Nights. The two Godfathers are on Ooh. all the time now because yep. I think Showtime has just stripped all their library except for the Godfathers and they're on constantly and I'm amazing. I just can feel like I can dive in at any time to those. Shawshank's a good yeah. one. Shawshank. Pulp Fiction. They, mm-hmm. I mean, there's certain ones that just- Any science fiction in there? 
Not for me personally, but for okay. a lot of people. I mean, there's a ton of comedies. I mean, you know, Tommy Boy, I'm not just saying this because Spade's on this, but it's Tommy Boy has become... The, the good thing about, especially when you get older and, and you have young kids and you can start showing them the comedies, mm -hmm. it's got to be one of the first six or seven because I don't know how old a kid has to be to understand Farley was one of the funniest people of all time and how funny mm -hmm. that movie is, but it's probably like age four where you can... <laughs> Like fat guy in a little coat, it might even be age three, but you can just oh, indoctrinate can them that, yeah. in that. So there, you know, there's, there's a bunch of the rewatchable. Like, What even, about me in the window watching the girl at the pool? Are they re rewatching yeah, that, that part? Maybe like fast forward. Is that 15, cut out of, I think second, that's but. cut out on TV. So there's, even really? Joe Dirt, there's stuff that's cut out and I, and I never know it. And then I go, so there's people that are seeing these movies with a couple of parts missing because it's so rough for TV. And I'm like, they don't even know those extra parts. I don't know. That's a bummer. That's One of the bummer. cool things now is like with YouTube and all these different places, like, you know, Dana's show from the mid nineties, like, I don't know, 20 of those sketches are on YouTube now. That was one of those things where if you love that show and then it gets canceled and it's gone, there's no, yeah. unless you taped it on your, on your sure. VHS, yeah. it's sure. gone. It's history. Yeah. And now kind of all that stuff has a second life, like shows like freaks and geeks. Yeah, you mm -hmm. can dive in that. Larry Sanders, which Shanling was always like famously never wanted it on DVD. He was always like very prickly about it. And now like every episode's on the Max app, you know? Yeah, so you so can- It's great. Nothing goes away up. now. We're all in- Nothing. We're all Love little Larry Sanders. cyber bits uh, next to- We're next to Godfather, next to everything else. It's just all there. Uh, could Airplane be made today? Yeah. I think the, the problematic ones, Animal House. Yeah. Um, if you're talking about- is this movie canceled now? Which we talk about a lot on the rewatchables, like Animal House, Revenge of the Nerds, um, Porky's. It's I don't know how women, Porky's a lot of happens stuff with women. Yeah, yeah. I don't know, I don't how know Porky's, Porky's the first time. How you explain? Yeah, I don't even know how you explain it mm. now. Much less than eighty three. Fast Times at Ridgemont High. Yeah, that. But that's a good movie though. Like at least yeah. it's well yeah. written. Sean Penn is so good in that. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. But yeah, some of the some of the seventies, eighties. I think Airplane's fine though. I just think a really silly movie right now because the country's in such a bad mood. If that's just joke per minute, almost just physical gags would be a, a nice look. Uh, yeah, it's weird the the airplane naked gun type of movie, which I was. I mean, that's what we all grew up with. It just mm -hmm. kind of is done. And then they would do the top secret, and they would do the um, yeah, oh yeah, top the rip off versions of of those kind of movies. But it was like twenty years of them. Then they made the scary movie franchise. Now nobody yeah. does any of those. Yeah. Yeah, never know. I don't know. That's my final question. All right. Uh, Thank you, Bill. Less. Bill, it's yeah, been a pleasure. I you guys are awesome. You hanging out with us. This was really fun. I forgot I was on a podcast <laughs> or even even hosting a podcast. So thank you. This was uh, you, fantastic. I love you guys. You guys got a, a fantastic podcast. This has been a presentation of Odyssey. Please follow, subscribe. Leave a like, a review, all the stuff, smash that button, whatever it is, wherever you get your podcasts. Fly on the Wall is executive produced by Dana Carvey and David Spade, Jenna Weiss Berman of Odyssey, Charlie Finan of Brillstein Entertainment, and Heather Santoro. The show's lead producer is Greg Holtzman. 